Hello. Welcome to the Stoneham Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill, Stoneham, Massachusetts. Our congregation has been serving the greater Boston area for more than 100 years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonehammemorialchurch.org, or by visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you and hope you feel God's presence as you join us for our weekly church service. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. I'm, I'm really pleased and happy to see you all are here. Lots of familiar faces. If I don't know your name, shame on me. I'm trying, uh, trying to learn more and more people's names. All right, shall we rise and sing our last song? is found in hymn number 279, Only Trust Him. <laughs> go back to school this week? Not yet? I oh, found one grown-up here that went back to school, but I don't think he's in kindergarten anymore. Oh, anybody, go, anybody going to kindergarten next year? You're going to kindergarten? And how old are you? 
six years old. So, this story I'm going to tell you guys is about a boy that was six years old and he was going to kindergarten. Now, does anybody go to GBA? No. Well, he went to GBA. So, you guys know where GBA is, right? Right down the street. Oh, actually, he's here. Do you guys want to know who this story is about? It's Anthony. Do you guys know Anthony? No? Who knows Anthony? He's right here. Say hi, Anthony. That's Anthony. He is my boy. So when he was about six years old and he was going to kindergarten, um, his grandpa would pick him up from school. Who picks you guys up from school? Who gets you from school? Your mom. How about Kate? Your mom, too. Yeah, so grandpa would pick him up, and they would have so much fun. He would get grandpa to do anything he wanted. He would, they, Anthony was usually hungry, so they'd go and get pizza or ice cream down friendlies or donuts and fries, and they'd go to the playground, they just had so much fun. And then grandpa would drop him off at the house and go back to work. So when they get to the house, Anthony would stay with grandma. Grandma was always home. So this one day, grandpa drove him home, saw him go in the house, and he went back to work. And then Anthony went in the house. Hey, Grandma, I'm home. He didn't hear Grandma call back. He said, Grandma, where is she? So he went to the furthest room in the house. Maybe she didn't hear him, and she wasn't there. He went into the bedrooms, and she wasn't there. And in the kitchen, she was not there. And he went everywhere, and she was nowhere to be found. He started to get a little panic. Do you guys stay home alone? No. Yeah, nobody? Yeah, no, he, did. he was not ever alone when he was home. So he went all over the house again. Grandma, Grandma, Grandma. And he started to panic because he was just so nervous and so worried that he was alone. It's like, where could she be? He said, you know what? I bet she went to the supermarket. I'm going to go look for her. Did you guys ever go to the supermarket by yourselves? No? You can't. And the supermarket was three blocks away, and they have to cross a really busy road. It's the Fells Way. Does anybody know the Fells Way? It's a really busy road. It has like six lanes of car to cross. But he was so nervous and so panicked that he was not thinking quite right. So he took off and started walking towards there. And then he walked one block and got to a bus stop. And there was people at the bus stop. And there was the bus also. And then there was this one man that saw him and said to him, Hey, little buddy, where are you going? It's like, well, I went home, and my grandma was not there, and I think she's at the supermarket, so I'm going to go there. It's like, he said to him, no, no, don't go. Turn around, go back home. Grandma's going to be there. So he said, oh, okay, I'll go back home. And he turned around and went home, and he went praying, and he said, he told me this story. He got actually a lot of peace. And he calmed down because he was praying that grandma would be home by the time he went back. So he opened the gate and closed behind him and went back home. Do you guys think grandma was there? She was. Guess where she was? Where she had been that he couldn't find her? She was in the basement picking up some laundry. That's a very unfortunate timing, right? Things like that can happen sometimes. You know, it's an accident, but, you know, it happened to that guy over there, and it was a really, really scary story.
I'm very happy that it turned out okay. Um, do you guys know, do you guys have any idea who this man was that talked to him? Say it again. The bus, no, it was not the bus driver. It was actually a guy who was getting into the bus. You guys don't know? I don't know either. Maybe someday in heaven I can ask Jesus, who was that man that talked to you, Anthony? But one thing I know for sure, God sent him. And God helped him help Anthony. Do you, do you know that God can use you also to help somebody? Do you think God can help use little kids, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, ten-year-olds? Can he help you? Can he, can he use you to help others? What are ways that you guys think you can help somebody? What if you have a friend that falls, everybody's going back to school, right? A friend that falls in, in the playground or you guys are playing sports. What can you do to help? You can go and see how they, you can ask how they're doing. You can help them get up. You can see that if they got maybe a scrape on their knee, you can take them to the nurse, Right? What if your teacher is overwhelmed? How can God use you to help her? You can pay attention in class and you can be helpful. You can go to your teacher, see if they need any help. There's many ways that God can use us. And how he uses us, he tells us that we, have, that we should do what to our neighbors? To love them. And act in loving ways so they can, they can feel the love of God to them when we love them. When you want to be the, the person who does, like, who helps somebody in a really big way, God can help you to do that. Just like he helped the man at the bus stop to tell Anthony to go back home. So, um, I'd like to pray for all of us today. Dear Lord. We thank you so much for your love and care, for watching over us, for helping us to um, be helpful to others as well. We ask you to please fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit so we can be light in the world and we can be loving to everybody that we, everybody that we know. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so uh, as you've heard, the pastor's got COVID. Uh, I apologize, I am no substitute for the pastor. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll make do as best we can. Um, but yeah, I think it's a reminder that you know, we think of our worship leaders, our pastors, our elders, as you know, because they're our worship leaders, they don't need our prayers, but they do. So pray for your pastor, pray for your elders all the time. Okay, so um, maybe on that note, I'll have a quick prayer before we start. Or let me turn this on so we can get the power. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you this uh, Sabbath day, we're about to open your word. Lord, I pray that I will decrease as your word increases. Help us to hear the word, to bring it into our hearts, to bring it into our lives. And today we make a special prayer for our pastor and, our, and his family. We pray that they are uh, kept safe, kept strong, and that they will be back with us very soon. Thank you, Lord, for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... Um, yeah, position for increase. Um, everybody, when, when, uh, when I gave the, the verse, my daughter read the, the scripture verse uh, today. That was another change. But um, when I gave it to her, my wife said, oh, are you going to talk about tithes? No, absolutely not. I'm not qualified to talk about tithes. Would never imagine it. No, we're not. We're going to talk about increase, okay? Because uh, very often, you know, we, we have these blessings. We're blessed. We're we're very lucky to be blessed. We have all these blessings, and these blessings are coming. They're flowing, and we're blessed, and we're blessed. And then suddenly, for something that maybe we don't understand, or for some reason we don't understand, the blessing stops. How do we feel? You know, maybe, maybe we lose a job. Maybe we miss out on an opportunity. Um, you know, a bill comes in. We, we were planning this nice little weekend holiday. A bill comes in, and that's the holiday gone, or the weekend gone. We lose a loved one. You know, whatever it may be, some blessing that we've received goes wrong it stops how do we feel you know does this make us feel abandoned does it make us feel forgotten rejected well the fact is the opposite is true god doesn't reject us it's generally us that rejects god so why do these blessings stop okay that's that's what this idea is or you know how how can we accept the fact or why you know why do these blessings end okay so isaiah 49:15 can you see that? Yeah, good. Okay, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. So God yeah, tells Zion, tells Israel, that he will never forget them. That means he's never going to forget us. So God cannot and will not forget us, okay? It's possible for a, a nursing mother, as the, as the uh, verse says here in Isaiah, it's possible for a nursing mother to forget her child, but it is not possible for God to forget his children, all of us. Yeah? So do we feel that we've been wrong, you know, done wrong by? When, when this blessing stops, when we've been having the blessing, and then all of a sudden, for outside of our understanding, the blessing stops, do we feel that we've been wronged? Yeah, that God has wronged us in some way, and that, you know, it's somewhat how unfair that this blessing that we've been enjoying is no longer flowing. Well, Job, we all know very well. Verse 22, uh, 20 to 22 says, Then Job arose, tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin. Okay? So everything we have, all of these blessings, come from the Lord. So then if, if God gave us everything and then decides to stop giving or to take some of those blessings back, is that unfair? Imagine, uh, I can see Brother Peter there. Imagine the weather's wonderful outside, but maybe it was a terrible day. I've got a jacket. Brother Peter needs to go a long way. And I lend him my jacket. But then next Sabbath, I go up to him and say, can I have my jacket back? You know, it's winter, I need my jacket. Would that be unfair? Would he suddenly throw the jacket on the floor? That's not fair, you gave me the jacket. It was mine, I want to keep it. Of course not, okay? It was always my jacket. I just lent it him. He was the steward of that jacket for a week. He was blessed by it, hopefully, but now it's back to me. I need it. But is that what God's doing? He's given us something one week and then thinking, oh, yeah, do you know what? No, I, that, that blessing wasn't meant for you. It was meant for somebody else. I haven't got enough on hand I haven't got enough blessing to go around so I better take some of that back just so I can pass it on to this other person okay well I think we know that every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation okay 
There's no shadow of turning. There's no changing of God's mind. Yeah, he knows exactly what he's going to do. He knows every situation. He doesn't make mistakes. Yeah, there isn't something that's going to suddenly make God think, oh, I didn't see that coming. That's unfortunate. Those blessings weren't meant for you. I better pass them on to someone else. He is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. That means to turn around, of course. He has said, and will he not do it? Okay, so if God says, he does. We know that. We believe that. At least we should believe that. If we're in this room and this time, we should believe that. God doesn't change his mind. He knows the beginning from the end. So there is no, there's no oh wow moment for God. There's nothing that catches him unawares that he didn't expect just coming around the corner. He's omniscient. That means he knows everything. So why? Why do blessings come to an end? Hopefully, we're going to get to the end of that. You know, by the end of this message, short message, we're going to get to the idea of where that comes from. So this is the verse that we read, or that uh, Vanessa read for us this morning. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Okay, lots of people read this verse. We all know this verse. We focus on that one line to try and admonish ourselves to, to give tithes. And you should. Yeah, but it says here that there may be food in my house and try me now in this. Test me. Yeah, the Lord. Very often, very few times the Lord says test me. Yeah, in fact it says that it's wrong to test the Lord. When Satan tested uh, Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus said don't test the Lord. Yeah, but here God is telling you, he's commanding you, test me. See what I can do for you when you let me do it, okay? So try me, says the Lord, okay? And uh, now in this, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. How much blessing can God pour from the windows of heaven? Yeah? He is asking you to put him in that position, to test him. He's asking you to do that. He's telling us, test me, see what I can do for you. But have we all done the things we can do to allow God to bless us? Have we done those things? Yeah, maybe it's us, as I said, that have strayed away, that have rejected or, or turned away from God. Maybe we've walked away from that blessing and then the blessings come to an end. And then, you know, is there any wonder? If I walk away from the light of life, can I complain that I'm in the darkness? Of course not. It's inevitable that if we leave that blessing or the, the, the source of blessing, the blessing will stop. But what if, what, if, um, what if I haven't walked away, okay? And I don't believe that God is like a spiteful giver. You know, he doesn't give and then he sees me this morning. Oh, Chris ran a red light. Uh, that's it. Blessings are over. Then maybe in a few days' time, I give $10 to a, a homeless person. Oh, okay, so the blessings come back again. And it's like some sort of tap on, off, on, off. God's not like that. Okay, God isn't watching us every moment and then blessing and, and turning this sort of never-ending tap of blessing on and off as we sort of go through life. It's not a roller coaster, yeah? But the, the blessings can never dry up. It's an endless, yeah, an endless uh, source of blessing. But here's the point. None of us can earn these blessings, yeah? Um, so we, we can be the reason that the blessings stop, but we're never the reason that the blessings are flowing. But if, like Job, we're doing the right thing, what happens then? So I'm doing everything, well, maybe not everything, but I'm, I'm living the life that God has given me. I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything that I feel is right. I'm righteous in the things that I do and say. And still the blessings stop, like Job. Yeah, being faithful and living a life of faith, at least as best we can, then why do the blessings stop? It can't be that God's forgotten us. We've just read that. So what is it? So let's imagine a, a scenario. Okay, I love my scenarios. You'll probably learn that by soon. Yeah. But imagine I'm stranded in the desert for some reason. Maybe my plane crashes or whatever it may be, and I'm stranded in the desert. And I'm walking across the desert, and I'm struggling. I've been walking lost for days, and I'm dying from lack of water. Okay? I'm about to give up. I fall down on my knees, and I start praying. And then I'm in the middle of the prayer, and I feel that my knees are wet. I think, oh. So I stop my prayer, and I dig a hole, and then... Lo and behold, in, as the hole gets deeper and deeper, it starts to fill up with water. Well, of course, I gratefully drink this water. It's warm, it's sandy, not very pleasant, but it's going to keep me alive. How do I feel? Do I feel it's a miracle and that God has answered my prayer? Absolutely, I'm going to feel that way. And I'd be right to feel that. It is a miracle. We've got an awesome God. God has heard my prayer and he's answered my prayer. So I drink the water, and then as the sun falls... 
water comes up through the earth again and there's a small puddle in the morning and again I drink that puddle down and night falls the next morning same again and I stay there am I ever gonna leave that puddle this is my life source I'm in the middle of a desert I'm lost I don't know if anyone's coming to find me I don't know where I am I don't know where I'm going am I ever going to leave that puddle one morning I wake up and there's no water how do I feel rejected abandoned yeah hard done by God you've given me this wonderful blessing now it's gone I spend the morning there waiting praying waiting for this water to come it doesn't come eventually I have to lick my wounds I stand up and I stagger I go over one June go over another June I'm just about to give up and I think I've got one more I'm gonna go over the last June and there's the Oasis waiting for me God knew it was there he'd given me this resource for a while for a temporary blessing but God knew there was better things over the next June if he had never dried that hole I would never have left I would have been stuck there but God had better things for me yeah over the next hill I would never have seen it so he had to God had to put an end to that blessing it was a temporary blessing it wasn't everything that God had for me because everything that God has for me is more than I can contain so that wasn't everything that I had or that was planned yeah it was not because I'd done anything wrong that it dried I just wasn't doing all that God had me to do he had a plan for my life and I wasn't living according to that plan to the fullest parts of that plan so God stopped those blessings because he wanted me to push on yeah into a position where he could bless me with even more yeah but I had to put myself in that position now consider the Israelites um, I'm taking a little bit of artistic license in this in these verses but um, you'll, you'll know them and you'll understand so consider the Israelites God made 10 miracles yeah in, in the plagues yeah so that they could leave come out of slavery th from Egypt so 10 miracles go by they see them they live them they're very evidential miracles another miracle to get 2 million people across the Red Sea just when they thought they were finished then God drowns the Egyptians the, uh, the Egyptian army and leads them towards a promised land yeah that he had promised to Abraham several hundred years before they walk for three days yeah to a place called Mara which means bitterness and they come across a pool that they couldn't drink God gives them another miracle in this tree they can throw the branches in to sweeten the water so they can drink it they go from that place uh, to a place called Elim which means strong trees apparently named because it had 12 uh, 12 wells of water and 70 trees so it was an oasis in the desert just like my desert so they come to that place and they stay there for a while then as they journey away from Elin just over six weeks after leaving Egypt they reach the wilderness of Sinai. what do they do they complain miracle 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 they go a few weeks away and they complain why we're hungry we're thirsty we had better food back in Egypt why have you dragged us all this way just for us to starve in the desert and luckily for us God is ever patient ever merciful and he's very patient with us and instead of just uh, telling them what, what they should do he fed them with manna okay so he rains manna down from he heaven another miracle okay and it says in Exodus 16 and the children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came into an inhabited land they ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan so they ate manna for 40 years six days a week or well, seven days a week they they ate, ate manna six days a week they they collected this manna off the ground seven days a week they ate manna we know what happened there were other miracles here yeah, we know about the spies in uh, and why they ended up walking in the desert for 40 years but there were many more miracles in the in the desert they struck or Moses struck a rock and they got water um, you know they got quails when they were complaining about meat quails flew in for their food uh, we know about the poisonous snakes there were many many more miracles so they've been eating mana six days uh, sorry collecting six days a week for 40 years eating seven days a week it was I think it was a sweet food I've never tried it of course but uh, maybe we'll get to try it one day but it was a, I think it was a sweet flowery taste um, probably not the nicest thing to eat for 40 years but I think we can all agree that it kept them alive for 40 years so they've been getting this wonderful blessing for 40 years every morning waking up the manas there they collect the more mana they cook the mana they eat the mana and then they go on about their daily business but then look what happens 
Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. So they've been walking for 40 years, eating manna, eating manna. All of a sudden, the manna stops. Okay? Now, they knew that the manna was God taking care of them. They were satisfied with the manna. They were, they were eating it. They were enjoying it. They were filled. They were full. They were alive. They were satisfied, but God wasn't. He had a land filled with milk and honey. He had the, the promised land that was waiting for them. Imagine after 40 years going outside and seeing manna on the floor to go out one morning and there's no manna. How would you feel? Confused. Panic, probably. You'd probably question, what's going on? Where's the manna? Why is there no manna? Yeah? They probably would have lived off the manna for the rest of their lives. Walking in the wilderness, if that was what was there. So, God stopped the manna to push them into looking for their own food. Go out, find the food. There's produce. The land is full of milk and honey. Go and find your own food. Yeah, go and find the vegetables of the ground. Go and find the animals that we can eat. Okay? He stopped it because he wanted them to have much more than just mana. So what we are satisfied with is just a temporary provision. Yeah, we're satisfied. Life is good. Great. But there's more. God wants us to have more. Yeah, God, well, Jesus Christ himself claimed that he didn't just come to give us a satisfactory life. He came to give us life and life more abundant. He wants us to have abundance, okay? He wants us to live an abundantly happy life. So, what does he do? He gives us a little nudge. He had to end that job because there's a better job waiting for you or another job or a different job, something around the corner. He had to move that friend away. He had to take that loved one because there was something else. Not because they weren't good, but because maybe in some way that we don't understand, those things are limiting us. They're stopping us from receiving all those blessings from the open windows of heaven. Those things have to come to an end because God wanted to bring something new, to push us into our ultimate purpose, whatever that may be. Now, these things are just temporary provisions. So when the mana stops, it means that God is getting us ready for more. Again, we've got to be in the position. If I'm here... I'm not going to get those blessings that I need from over there. So God wants us in the position so that he can increase us with blessings. He's closed that door so that he can open a better door somewhere else. How do we react? How will we react? Will we lose faith? Or worse, will we curse God, as Job's wife tried to convince him to do? Or like Job, will we praise God and say, well, if this has happened, there must be a plan. The next thing in my life must be better for me. There must be a reason. God hasn't forgotten me. He hasn't rejected me. We know these things. But yet, when that blessing stops, the first thing we think of is, God's forgotten me. God's rejected me. Why have you forsaken me? Where is the blessing? He stopped the, prov the provision, the blessing, to prepare us for an even better future. But if we walk away then we may never see those blessings. If we turn away, we may never see those blessings. If God had not stopped the water filling up that small hole, or if he did, I had just stayed there and given up and curled up on the floor and died in the desert, I would never have found the oasis across the road. Yes, it's hard when a good thing comes to an end, but we need to dig deep and find some extra faith, not give up on the faith we've got. We need to find extra faith to get us to that next step doors are closing but we need to hang on because new doors are about to open god says trust in the lord with all your heart how many of us read that verse but then don't and lean not on your own understanding maybe we don't know why something has stopped maybe we don't know why something has ended in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path not the path you want him to direct you down. Yeah? Not the path that you keep refusing because you don't want to take that path. You want to, you're waiting for God to direct you down this path because that's the one that looks nicer. God will direct your path. He knows what path it is. He knows where it leads. And he knows what you will find at the end of it. So we may not understand why, but we need to trust that whatever seems to be going wrong in our lives is only getting us ready for something better down the line. 
Sometimes we have to say goodbye to something that we're familiar with, that we enjoy, that we like. Maybe we're too comfortable with it, and it's now becoming an idol in our lives. God's got to take those things away. Otherwise, we might not move on and find the blessings that God has for us just around the corner. If we stand still and never make it around that corner, we're never going to know. When a door closes, we can't sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah, dwelling on what we had and thinking of a time, where, you know, a, a glorious time in the past when I was so happy. Or worse, try and smash that door down, trying to force God to reopen the door that he's just closed. Because we want that thing back. We can't accept that we won't have it. That, bla that blessing's passed on. It's gone. And we need to move forward to new and better things, to new and better blessings. God never closes a door, never closes a door, unless he is about to open another door for us. Maybe not immediately, maybe not for weeks, months. Yeah, we have to learn patience. Those blessings have got us to where we are now, but we need to give them up and move on. So this reminds me, and again, just to try and solidify what I'm saying in, in the Bible, you think of a, a time when Elijah, yeah, when there was a drought and a famine, he ran. Uh, it's a whole new story why he ran, but he ran from uh, Jezebel, his, his, uh, you know, his fear. And he ran and he hid in a brook called... Uh, he knew that God would provide for him. And it will be, in 1 Kings 17, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So Elijah stayed at this brook, and he drank from the brook in the middle of a famine. How many brooks would there be? This was the only one left. He had no food, so the ravens brought food to him. So Elijah didn't have to work for his food. He was well fed, well watered, in the middle of a drought. Certainly he was in need of a vacation, yeah. Um, I've got another message, maybe one day we'll hear it, uh, hero to zero, you know. Elijah went from a hero to a, to a faithless uh, wanderer very, very quickly, but he's here now, and certainly he needed a vacation. Uh, from being a prophet because he didn't have a usual you know an easy time but look what happened then and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land well God had sustained this brook until that moment the whole land had been dry for three years but this brook this one brook potentially was still flowing with water Elijah was drinking eating he was comfortable he was rested he was probably feeling pretty good about himself and then one morning poor old Elijah wakes up and the holiday's over, the vacation has finished and it's dried up and he's got to go back to business. Why? Not because God had rejected Elijah, but because he had something else for him to do. He had another place for him to be. And for as long as that brook was flowing and as long as those ravens were bringing nice snacks to him, he was never going to go anywhere. And God knew that. And why would he? Yeah, he's, he's a human, he's wise enough to know, take the good things when they come. But because had another place, because God had another place for him, something else he had to do, yeah, he dried up that blessing. And Elijah thought, I'm God's prophet, he's going to provide for me. But then when it stopped, yeah, he might have just stayed there and thought, oh, maybe God's just having a day off. I'll, I'll stay there till tomorrow to see if the, if the brook comes back and the, and the birds come back. But they didn't, of course. Instead, Elijah leaves for a place, yeah, uh, of, um, he, he, re he leaves this place of rare comfort and he heads to Sidon where he meets the, the widow, we know. And what does he do there? He raises the widow's son. He had a job to do. He would never have left that small pool of blessings to go to better things. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So God here is saying, no one can shut the doors that he's open, and no one can open the doors that he's shut. Yeah, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, you know, extrapolate that from the sentence. But any guy, anytime God closes a door, he will open another door. It may not be immediate, but we can be patient, and we can trust, and that's a big word, trust and wait. And look, look and see the blessings that are coming. Take the providence of the Holy Spirit. Pray about it. God, you've stopped this. I know there's a reason. I know there's a plan. Show me the plan. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do next? He'll lead you. 
We may have to be patient, but he'll lead you. God knows we don't have much strength, but he won't keep us waiting longer than we can bear, as long as we keep his word, as long as we don't deny Jesus. We accept that it's a plan. We accept that we're part of that plan. Then the door will be opened to us. But before we find that door, if we dwell in our misery and, you know, start licking our own wounds and start complaining, if we blame God for the door closing, we may never find the open door. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulders, so he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. So the key, we will be given the key to get through the doors. Yeah, but before we know what the key is, we have to know, sorry, before we know what the door is, we have to know what the key is. Okay? Jesus says in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he must be saved. Oh, sorry, he will be saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus isn't looking for the door in your life. Jesus is the door in your life. He's the key to finding the door. And he is the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. If I make an abode, it's a, a homely, comfortable place to live. Yeah, We're going to live with Jesus. What is the first thing you do when someone moves in with you? You give them the key. Yeah, Welcome to my humble abode. Here's the front door key. This is how you get in and out of my house. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the key. And if we love him and keep his word, his commandments, then he will give us the key to his path in our lives. He will always come out of trials better. Sorry, we will always come out of trials better. So we all face trials. I may be facing a trial now, whatever it may be. Whatever that trial is, the other side of the trial will be better than the side I went in. Guaranteed. If we trust God will help us, if we invite God into our difficulties, don't, don't pray that you're going to avoid the trials because those trials we need. We need those trials. Paul says it's through many trials and tribulations that we enter the kingdom of heaven. We need those trials. Don't pray to be re rescued from the trial. Pray that you'll be comforted in the trial. Okay? Invite God into our difficulties. Then he will not only see us through the tough time, but when he brings us out the other side, he will give us more than we went in with. And at the very least, we've learned some patience, endurance. I'm not very patient. I need to learn that. Patience, endurance, character, trust, faith, hope. Yeah? Look at Job. He praised God through the trial. He invited God into the trial. And when God brought him through, he had double the things that he had before. God remembered, yeah, what he had said. And Job trusted in his promises. Because he trusted God, he had hope in whatever the future through God might hold. Not the future through us, not a hope in ourselves. He had hope. We all know this verse. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you future and a hope. So if we all know this verse so well, we can, most of us can recite it. It's one of those verses, memory verses that we learn. If we all know this verse so well, how many of, our, of, of us right now are at peace? We have nothing to worry about. How many of us are at peace? How many of us are filled with hope for the future? How many of us right now are fully invested in God's plan for our lives? How many of us are looking forward to the hopes of the new blessings? Instead of clinging to those old hopes that have dried up blessings of the past. Well, to answer what we need to understand this, to answer this sort of question of hope, what is hope, we need to think about what that is in a context of two different, uh, two different contexts, I suppose you could say. If we were out on a field trip, maybe this afternoon as we're going to the park, uh, you see this wonderful looking bridge and our campsite is on the other side of that bridge and our guide is standing here and he says, don't worry, you know, I've been across this bridge a couple of times. I hope it's going to be okay. Who wants to go first? I don't suppose there'll be many takers. 
Why not? What's wrong? I mean, hasn't the guide got hope? I hope that this bridge will support your weight. My guess would be you've probably got a 50% chance of success, maybe less if you're my size, of getting across that bridge. But the guide's got hope. Well, that sounds good, isn't it? This is another type of hope in Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Well, that statement almost sounds similar. The guide had hope that you're not going to fall through this bridge to your death. We can have hope in, in waiting on the Lord's word. At first glance, they might look like they're similar, but I think it becomes clearer when we look at two other verses from Romans. Yeah, Psalms is still at the top there. But look at these two other verses in Romans 5. Now hope does not disappoint. If you're not going to be disappointed, that's a guarantee. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given, who was given to us. Romans 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Again, we're talking about joy and peace. Why? Because I know who's in control. I have hope in something that isn't going to fail that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what's the difference in the two statements about hope? Yeah, the guide is hoping that the bridge is safe, yet yeah, they're putting their faith in some rotten old wood and some, some broken ropes. But the hope that Paul is writing about, and, and that the writer of Psalms is writing here, is in the hope of God's word, in the hope of a love, in the love of God, and in the hope of the Holy Spirit. So you can see the difference because all of those things, a hope in God, a hope in God's love, it will never fail. We've just seen God is not varying. He doesn't change his mind. There are no shadows in God's will. Everything is clear. Everything is straight. These three things, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, they're a surefire success. They cannot fail. So our hope for the future comes from the same place as our peace in the past. Trust. If you trust what you read every Sabbath, every day that you study your Bible. If you trust and believe those things, then you've got hope. God's love is unconditional. Your hope, your trust, can be and should be unconditional. And I can promise you, when it is, you will be at peace. You won't worry about the bill that you can't pay at the end of the month, because it will be taken care of somehow. You won't worry about whether your car is going to get you all the way to Florida. Because it will. Somehow you'll get there. Maybe the car will break down. But you'll get there. Somehow. None of your problems are beyond God. If you trust God in that, then God is going to bless you. He's going to bless you with something you didn't even see coming. That next corner. That next hill. Whatever it may be. He is going to bless you. All you have to do is trust in the hope. Okay? And believe me, this is one lesson, I've got many more lessons to learn, this is one lesson that I have learned in my life, and I can promise you, you can ask my wife, I don't worry about anything. I haven't, I haven't worried about anything for a long, long time, and I sleep well at night. And it's good, trust me. So, to finish, I want to talk about this pastor, you might recognize him, um, Pastor, uh, pastor Bobby Grunewald, okay? Uh, he runs a church, or he's a lead pastor at a church, Life.Church. And in 2006, seems like a million years ago now, but 2006, the internet was just coming into its own, and, you know, things were starting to be developed. And Pastor Grunewaldi decided there should be a Bible website. I shouldn't have to carry this Bible around with me all the time. What if I'm in the library? What if I'm at school? What if I'm at work? I can't carry my Bible. Let's create a Bible website. That was new. No one had thought of that before. He did it. He created a Bible website. He's a pastor. He's bringing the Bible to everyone in the world, literally. It's, it must work. It's got to be blessed. That's what he thought. Okay, the first month, they activated this website. 20,000 people visited the site in the first month. He thought, okay, that's okay. But he'd invested a lot of money, almost all of his money, his life savings, into this um, into this website, and 20,000 people was not going to be enough. So after a year went by, he was about ready to shut the website down and give it a, you know, call it a day, say, right, that was it, I tried, I don't know what, 
what happened? God seems to have rejected me, he's turned his back on me, whatever it may be, this website clearly isn't working. So they get together in their, in their group and he says, as a last desperate attempt, he says, I know, I've got a much better idea. Instead of the website, let's try and get the Bible on this brand new gadget that everybody's talking about. Yeah? This is about 2007, mobile phones. So he says, let's put the Bible on here. And again, everyone's like, are you sure? How on earth are you going to read a Bible on a tiny screen? No one's going to go for it. It's a, it's a ridiculous idea. Let's do it, he says. So they literally invest everything they've got left. Instead of taking what he had and, and just accepting that it was a bad idea, he put everything he did, he could, into this uh, idea of putting something on a phone. Um, and it says here, not long after, he and his team redesigned their website to be, work, you know, to be workable on a phone. Apple announced this brand new thing called the App Store. And they said, we're going to develop this platform that is going to allow other people to put apps onto phones. That was just around the corner. Bobby Grunewald did not know that when he had this idea. And if he had never tried it, he would have failed miserably. And that would have been the end of it. So he goes, cap in hand, down to Apple and says, look, do you know what? I've got a great idea for one of your first ever apps. Let's use this thing that we've developed. We've got it ready. It's good to go. And on the first day that Apple opened their new app store, there was an app on there to download a Bible. They were hoping for 80,000 downloads in the first year. That would have made them break about even. In the first day, they had 83,000 downloads in in one day. Today, and I was Googling this last night trying to find recent issue information, so I hope this is still fairly current. Today, over 705 million people have downloaded their YouTube, uh, sorry, their version Bible app. I've got one on my phone. I would imagine most of us have got it on our phone. Yeah? It seemed like things weren't going well, that he wasn't getting blessed. It seemed like his vision wasn't going to work. That God had closed the door, that this wasn't the right thing to do. Instead of just throwing his hands up in the air and giving up, he decided to wait on God's blessing. Yeah, the brook had dried up, but Pastor Bobby decided to trust in the God that he knew was going to bless him, and he waited. He didn't know what was around the corner. He didn't know the blessings that were going to come. But he trusted. Instead of giving up, he trusted that God was going to open another door. He allowed himself to be pushed into a much better blessing. So don't fight everything. If something starts to go wrong, let it go wrong. Pray. Ask for guidance. Accept that God has got a plan in your life. Maybe this is just a temporary blessing coming to an end because there's a much better blessing coming around the corner. Don't fight everything that God's planned in your life. We don't need to understand what God's doing. God knows what he's doing. He's got a plan. If you trust that God has got a plan for your life, and you trust that that plan is good for you, how much can God pour out of the windows of heaven? More than we can ever hope for. More than we can ever ask for. More than we can ever contain. You're in God's hands. Let go and let God nudge you, sometimes gently, sometimes a little bit more forcefully, because we're a bit stubborn, but let him nudge you in the right direction. Amen. Thank you for the powerful sermon. Let's all rise and sing our closing song. It's found in hymn number 522. My Lord is still
Father. Lord, in those times where we feel that you have forgotten us, that these things that we have had have gone and we don't understand why. Lord, fill us with faith, especially in those moments. Help us to remember who you are. Help us to remember why you came. Help us to remember what you've done. And Lord, when we remember these things and remember that your word is solid like a rock that we can stand on and be faithful and know that you are bringing us to a better place, to a more blessed place, to the place that you have designed for us. Lord, help us to look for that place, to welcome that place and to glorify your name in everything that you do for us and in everything that we can do for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you would like to get in contact with us, please visit our website at stonemmemorialchurch.org or call us at 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person at our church on Saturdays for our 1055 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer and fellowship at 630 p.m. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace.